security, then sudden destruction will come upon them, as labor pains come upon a pregnant woman, and there will be no escape. But you, beloved, are not in darkness, for that day to surprise you like a thief, for you are all children of light and the children of the day. We are not of the night or of the darkness. So then let us not fall asleep as others do, but let us keep awake and be sober. For those who sleep, sleep at night, and those who are drunk, get drunk at night. But that since we belong to the day, let us be sober and put on the breastplate of faith and love. And for a helmet, the hope of salvation. For God has destined us not for wrath, but for obtaining salvation through our Lord Jesus Christ, who died for us, so that whether we are awake or asleep, we may live with him. Therefore, encourage one another and build up each other as indeed you are doing. Our gospel reading is from Matthew, the 25th chapter, starting with the 14th verse. Would you stand, please, for this reading? For it is as if a man, going on a journey, summoned his slaves and entrusted his property to them. To one he gave five talents, to another two, to another one, to each according to his ability, then he went away. The one who had received the five talents went off at once and traded with them and made five more talents. In the same way, the one who had the two talents made two more talents. But the one who had received the one talent went off and dug a hole in the ground and hid his master's money. After a long time, the master of those slaves came and settled the accounts with them. The one who had received the five talents came forward, bringing five more talents, saying, Master, you handed over to me five talents. See, I've made you five more talents. His master said to him, Well done, good and trustworthy slave. You have been trustworthy in a few things. I will put you in charge of many things. Enter into the joy of your master. And the one with the two talents also came forward, saying, Master, you handed over to me two talents. See, I have made two more talents. His master said to him, Well done, good and trustworthy slave. You have been trustworthy in a few things. I will put you in charge of many things. Enter into the joy of your master. Then the one who had received the one talent also came forward, saying, Master, I knew that you were a harsh man, reaping where you did not sow and gathering where you did not scatter seed. So I was afraid, and I went and I hid your talent in the ground. Here you have what is yours. But the master replied, You wicked and lazy slave, you knew, did you, that I reap where I did not sow and I gather where I did not scatter? then you ought to have invested my money with the bankers, and on my return I would have received what was my own with interest. So take, take the talent from him and give it to the one with the ten talents. For to all the, those who have, more will be given, and they will have an abundance. But from those who have nothing, even what they have will be taken away. As for now, this worthless slave, throw him into the outer darkness where there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. This is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. Who are you? Are you a Republican? You know, a tyrant who wants to bring down the democracy of our country? Or are you a Democrat? A radical leftist who wants to bring lawlessness to our cities? Or are you an independent who's just an anarchist at all? Are you a member of those who believe that black lives matter? Are you a member of those who believe that blue lives matter? Which one are you? We all have our preferences. We all have our likes and dislikes. We all have those things that we are drawn to or not drawn to. We all have our own blessings and talents and gifts. And that's what we see in this morning's gospel lesson. And as I was researching it, 
I was realizing that there are many ways to come at this particular parable and this reading. Um, and some of them are quite different from the others. But I decided to go with the one that spoke to me, which is the traditional way of seeing this parable. So we have Jesus talking about a master, just any master, because it appears two different ways. Here today we have it in um, Matthew, but it also appears in Luke, and it's different there, but basically it's the same. There's a master, and the master gives ten talents or bags of gold or whatever it is to the one servant because the master's going away. And the master's going to give to the servants these talents so that the master can go and do the important things that he wants to do, and he will leave um, the grunge work of everyday business to his servants. So he gives to the one servant ten talents or bags of gold and to the second servant five talents and to the last one he gives one. <clears throat> and the master goes away with confidence in his servants. When he comes back, he calls each one of the servants together and asks them for an accounting of what has happened while he was gone. The first servant says, well, you gave me 10 talents and master, I went and I worked them and I was able to multiply them. And now I've got 20. There's 10 more for you. The second service servant came and he said, I also did whatever I could for you. I did the best I could and I multiplied my five, and now I have another five, and so here's ten for you. And then the poor last servant, <clears throat> he realized what a harsh man he was working for. And he was afraid. He didn't want to get in trouble. He didn't want to lose any part of what the master had already given him. So <clears throat> he went and he dug a hole and he buried the talent, and he thought, well, this will keep me safe and secure, because at least I won't lose anything. By the time the master gets back, he'll have no less than what he gave me to take care of. So he tells this to the master. And the master, of course, is very happy with the first two servants. And he says, you, who made me an extra ten, Good job. That's really good. Thank you for being so industrious and so faithful. I'm going to put you in charge of even more because you did so well with the ten talents. And you with the five talents, same thing. Good job. Thank you for being so industrious and multiplying these talents. Now I've got ten. I'm going to put you in charge of even more as well. But the poor servant who was too cautious, the master said to him, you knew I was a hard person. You knew I was a hard person to satisfy, and you knew I expect a lot from the people who work for me. And here I've come back, and you haven't multiplied anything at all. You only had one. You didn't even multiply that by half. You went and stuck it in the ground, and now all I have is this one on my return. So he says, take that away from him. Give it to somebody else who will be more industrious and multiply it. And take this lazy servant out where there will be weeping and wailing and gnashing of teeth. <coughs> Doesn't sound good, does it? <coughs> but remember that this is a parable. It's not a true story. <coughs> It is meant to be an illustration of a concept that Jesus wants people to know. So there's hyperbole involved, right? Things are either much, much better than they would be in real life or much, much worse 
because Jesus is telling this parable to really make an imprint on people's minds. And it's an illustration for this concept <clears throat> that all lives matter, that everyone matters to God equally, every single person. <clears throat> and it doesn't matter what gifts or talents they've been given, every one of us matter to Jesus and to God. And, <clears throat> excuse me, everyone has something to offer. No matter how little they have, every person has something to offer, even if all they can do is pray, sit and pray, because perhaps they have disabilities and that's all that they can do, or they're very ill. But everybody has something to offer. And we all know that there are people in this world who have great gifts, talents, and abilities. Um, and sometimes they are in situations where they are given a platform or they have more possibilities open to them to use their gifts, talents, and abilities. <clears throat> Some people we know have a talent for making money. Some people have that technical talent and they work on technical things that nobody else wants to. And so they make a lot of money. There are other people um, who are very good at being in the military, very gifted at that. There are others, of course, who are very talented in the entertainment ways, either in music or acting or athletics or anything. And they make a lot of money too. And they have wonderful athletic talents, they have musical talents, they have acting talents, and oftentimes they're beautiful people to boot, and they have it all. But it doesn't matter, we've all been given something. And this parable is saying that God expects us to use whatever it is that we have been given. And as I said, everybody has something. And Jesus and God expect us to use whatever it is that has been given us and to use it to the best of our ability, to make it even better, whatever gifts, talents, and abilities we have, to help ourselves grow so that we can use them to the best of our ability and we can multiply them so that we can do the best for ourselves, for our families, for our communities, and for the world. And all this will be to the glory of God because it helps to bring about the kingdom of God on this earth. You know, there are a lot of people now who say that they are not religious, but they are spiritual. And then there are people who would maybe say they are neither. But if you ask most people, they'll tell you they would like to be a part of making the world a better place. And as Christians, this is how we do it. We take whatever has been given us, those gifts, talents, abilities, whatever, whether they're great, whether they're small, and we do what we can to multiply them, to use them to the best of our ability for the betterment of the world, because that is how we bring about the kingdom of God here on earth. And so we make the world a better place for everyone, and we bring glory to God, who created us and gave us those gifts, talents, and abilities. Now, maybe you don't have uh, the ability to sing or play an instrument. Maybe you don't have athletic ability. Maybe you can't act. You've never been good at making money or, or even in school, really. Um, but there are other things that you may have been given that you don't even think of. Perhaps you're the person with the sense of humor. And so when times are hard, 
or things are really rough, perhaps you're the person that can help lighten things up for people and brighten their day with a little bit of humor. Maybe you are the person who has been given the gift of being able to be calm in any storm and to help other people through it. And so when something catastrophic happens, maybe you are the one that keeps your head and helps others to see the light at the end of the tunnel. But everyone, everyone has been given something. And so this parable is about the concept that Jesus is trying to say that we are responsible for multiplying those gifts, talents, and abilities and using them to the fullest capacity for the betterment of the world, to make this world a better place for all of us, and to bring about the kingdom of God and glory to God. And sometimes in our lives, gifts, talents, or abilities can be taken away. And sometimes we have to learn how to live in a different way and to rely on other gifts, talents, and abilities. So some of you may have seen recently on 60 Minutes a story about a man named Chris Downey. Chris Downey was living a good life outside of San Francisco, California. He was married and he had a 10-year-old son and he had a good job as an architect for which he had been well trained. <clears throat> He was able to be a coach for his son's teams, and Chris Downey was living the good life. Then one day, Chris was having a catch with his son. And as the ball kept going back and forth, it kept going in and out of focus for Chris. And he didn't know what was going on, but it was getting worse. So he went to the doctor, and poor Chris found out that he had a brain tumor. It could be removed, but it was very close to the optic nerve. But of course, Chris had found very good doctors. They told him they could remove it, and there was a risk of going blind, but that in all the times that the doctor had done this surgery, that had never happened. Well, unfortunately for Chris Downey, this was the one time that that surgery did cause blindness. Chris says when he woke up for 24 hours, he had his sight. The following day, he only had half of his sight. And the day after, it was dark, just completely dark. And he admits that he had dark moments in his mind as well about moving forward. How could he possibly do his job? How could he possibly do anything? How could he possibly support his family anymore? How could he even have a catch with his son? But he says he remembers that he lost his own father when he was young. He was a child. And he said he always remembers being so grateful for the short amount of time that he had with his father here on earth. And so he thought about his son, and he thought how much his son needed him. And he decided that he was going to make the best of what was left to him of his gifts, talents, and abilities. Unfortunately, this all occurred right around 2009 when the economy was struck by a depression here in this country. And once again, Chris had the bad luck of being at a company where he lost his job. So not only did he not have his sight, but now he didn't have a job in a bad economic time. But you know, he got involved with the Lighthouse Corporation out there. 
and it is a nonprofit organization that was set up to help people who have lost their sight, not to those who have been blind since birth, but to adults who have lost their sight, many of them veterans. And so now they are facing all the obstacles of how to get along every day in their everyday life. Uh, now being dependent on either um, a cane, a walking stick, or a guide dog, or some other aid that they would have to rely on. And he says he was able to be able to have a catch with his son again. He figured he was going to do whatever he could do. So his son would stand somewhere and he would tell him he was throwing him the ball. And Chris learned to listen for the ball to come at him. And when it was time for Chris to throw the ball back, his son would talk to him to let him know in what direction to throw the ball. And as far as his job, he learned how to read blueprints and elevations from the computer, which printed them out in Braille. And he even came up with his own kind of Braille for architecture. And he even came up with his own way of making changes to the blueprints and the papers that he had in front of him, he took wax and raised it on there and he could feel it. And they actually had another blind architect there. He was working with other people who were blind themselves, not all of them. But it's amazing because after all of this, he had lost his job but he realized that there was a company that was looking for somebody who did not have their sight. They were looking for a blind architect. And they wanted this person because they wanted to picture buildings that would be easily navigated by those who had lost their sight and would be helpful to them. And it needed to be somebody who was blind themselves so that they could think about all the ways that they could make these buildings uh, easily navigated and comfortable for those who were blind and were losing their sight. And so he said he remembers walking around the buildings that he used to walk through every day going to work. He says it was absolutely terrifying the first time he had to cross the street using just his cane, his blind person stick. Absolutely terrifying. He said when he would go through the buildings that he used to walk through and the streets, he, would, he was now listening very carefully to the sound of his cane on the floor and he would listen to how it sounded in the buildings. Some buildings were very close and had good acoustics and he could hear it very well and the sound didn't travel all over the place. In other buildings, it was just, the sound just scattered everywhere and it was hard to listen and hear it. And so Chris was taking all these things into consideration and he helped to build a new building which was for those who had lost their sight recently, who were going to come there for the lighthouse project and to learn how to navigate in this world. And he's even been called to help with the hospital for the blind. And so he feels now that he is a better architect today than he ever was. He says that 
He feels it was the hand of God. Leslie Stahl asked him, you had to believe it was God's hand coming down, that you lost your sight, you lost your job, and that this organization was looking for somebody who was blind. And he said, yes. He said, I think this whole thing took my disability and turned it upside down. All of a sudden, he said, it defined the unique, unusual value that virtually nobody else had to offer. He had lost the gift, talent, ability to see, but he had gotten other talents. He had to rely on the others, and he learned how to do so much and to give so much. He says, I'm absolutely convinced that I am a better architect today than I was when I had my sight. So Leslie Stahl asked him about gaining his sight back. How would he feel? Would he still like to have his sight back? And he said, I don't know. He said, I'm afraid I would lose what I've been working on. He said, I really don't think about having my sight restored. restored. He said, there could be th some things that would be easier. He said, but would it make my life better? I don't think so. To have his sight back, absolutely amazing. And what else is amazing is after giving this sermon at Fairview, when I left, somebody came up to me afterwards and told me that their brother was in a very similar situation. Now, Chris Downey went blind at the age of 45. And let's face it, he could have collected Social Security and been a man of leisure or done whatever. But he decided not to do that with his gifts, talents, and abilities. And so this person came up to me at Fairview and said that his brother had been the same way, that he had been born with sight in just one eye. And when he was 45, he was in an accident, and it took the sight from his other eye. And he said the same thing, that his brother was down for a while, and he could have done the same thing. He was 45 years old, and he could have taken the Social Security and been a man of leisure, but he decided not to do that. He decided to go and learn Braille, <clears throat> and he became a teacher to children, to students. He went to Louisiana and Florida, and he found areas where wealthy people had children who were blind and they needed help getting through high school. And so this man's brother was able to help them. Gifts, talents, and abilities that maybe he never would have had, but he took what God gave him. Both he and Chris Downey took what God gave them and what was left after they suffered these accidents and multiplied those gifts, talents, and abilities and used them to the best of their ability to make this world a better place for themselves and for other people and to help bring about glory to God by bringing about God's kingdom here on earth. And remember that Jesus came into the world for everybody and that Jesus loves everybody equally, no matter who they are, or what they believe, and that Jesus knows that every person has been given gifts, talents, and abilities by God, blessings, and that each one of us is responsible for using them, for multiplying them, to using them in the best ways that they could possibly be used for the best things for the world, and for God. And so I invite you this coming week to think about that. What 
are the gifts, talents, and abilities that God has given you? Are you very talented in ways that people can see? Or do you have those other gifts, talents, and abilities of making people laugh, being the one to keep your head in a time of disaster? What are they? And are you using them for yourself, for your family, or for to make the world a better place? Are you using those gifts, talents, and abilities to bring glory to God by helping to bring about the kingdom of God here on this earth? Amen. And this is the time where we would normally be collecting our tithes, gifts, and offerings for the Lord. But of course, with COVID, we cannot do that. So please remember that we have two plates in the back by the front doors. One is uh, donations for the church. The other is donations for Agape House. If you are joining us online, please look to the bottom of your screen and you will see a way that you may also contribute to either of those two things. Uh, and if you like, you may also mail it into the church. And now I would ask Darren, if he would please play our doxology. And now please join in our prayer of dedication. Generous God, your good gifts to us are too many to name. We have been so blessed, not so that we might hide away those blessings, but to use them so that the blessings might be multiplied. As we give from our blessing stockpile, help it to multiply and grow. May our gifts empower multiple acts of mercy and compassion. And may your love pour over this world like a flood. If we have buried these gracious blessings, may today be the day we dig them up and put them to work so that we might be seen as your faithful servants. Amen. And now we will have our last hymn, I'm going to live so God can use me. Anywhere, Lord, anytime. 
receive the blessing. Go now in love and peace, remembering that Jesus came into the world for every single person, has given every single person gifts, talents, and abilities that are to be used to make this world a better place and bring about the kingdom of God on this earth. Take that message out with you into all the world. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, amen. Thank you.